What is up, bosses? Before we start this week's episode, I want to tell you about our sponsor. It is Fundrise. Now, in 2021, a truly diversified portfolio needs more than just the traditional mix of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. You need to be in private real estate, and that's where Fundrise comes in. In fact, Johnny, Sam, and myself have all personally invested in Fundrise even before they were a sponsor of Invest Like a Boss. So if you want to check out Fundrise for yourself, I'm going to tell you more during the break, but get a head start. Go to fundrise.com slash like a boss. That's F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash like a boss. Now on to this week's episode. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny F.D. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Welcome back, bosses, to episode 203. I'm sitting here in Barcelona, and before we get into this week's episode, and I introduce you to Derek, who's sitting in LA. I just wanted to say, God damn it, I think the internet is broken, and it has become the most frustrating thing to spend time on. How many times a day, Derek, are you accepting cookies to read a simple headline? It's... (laughs) <laughs> Got to be over 10 times a day. I used to, when it first started, what, maybe a month or two ago, I would be like, oh, let me pick the actual cookies that I'm going to let them have. Now I'm like, just take all the cookies. You can have all the cookies. I'm the, I'm the opposite. The I'm rejecting all. I'm so pissed. <laughs> I'm counter this whole movement. It's such bullshit. And between that and all the spam that I get that I can't unsubscribe to, and I just email back blasting them like, you don't allow me to wait to unsubscribe to your emails and I'll tell you what, the internet has become a very, a very uh, stressful and unfriendly place to spend time. And I got to think that the metaverse is just going to make it worse. But uh, tangent aside, this week, we are talking about a really exciting topic that we haven't touched on in a ton of detail in the past. We're actually talking about venture capital and not just any venture capital, but venture capital that is accessible for non-accredited investors. Derek, why don't you tell us a little bit more? Yeah. So we're talking to Jesse Randall. He's the CEO of Sweater Ventures. And again, like last week, Sam, when we talked to Charity Vest, it's, it's this new platform that is available to the masses, whereas venture capital and you know donor advised funds, they were all kind of available just for the 1% or the really uh, highly multimillionaires out there. But now with, all, with this job at, Jobs Act that came out uh, under the Obama administration, all these new funds are popping up that the SEC is now allowing non-accredited people to jump into a world where only accredited was allowed before. And this, as far as I can tell, is the first fund dedicated just to venture capital. I've been saying this for ever since we started this episode, or this podcast rather, is I think the 2020s will be the best time ever in the history as an investor to make returns. And this is just another way that you're able to get access to an exciting act. Uh, exciting access uh, a- asset class. Sorry, um, the Vega Cecilia is a uh, is drying out my mouth, and um, <laughs> the tannins are just so so overwhelming. <laughs> How much did that bottle cost you, Sam? This is. Can you see it? Are we on video? I can see it. Yeah. Uh, this is the Vega listeners C- on the podcast cannot see it. <laughs> this is Vega Cecilia Unico, 2010. It's Spain's best bottle of wine. And um, this bottle runs about 350 euros. So what's that exchange rate? About 450? Uh, About 450, yeah. Now, this is not a typical bottle of wine that I'm having on an average night, but I actually, in the side room, my uh, my attorney who's done the the golden visa uh, application for me over the last two years, the longest longest application they've ever processed. Uh, But finally, my golden visa got issued. So I invited him over to to enjoy this bottle. And... um, Damn, is it good? I'll tell you what, it's hard, <laughs> hard to justify a $450 bottle of wine, but this is pretty close to it. Uh, what were we talking about before that? <laughs> so we're talking, <laughs> we're talking about getting into these venture capital funds as a non-accredited investor. Now, I'm glad I'm doing this episode with you, Sam, because obviously you have experience in the venture capital world, but have you ever been involved directly with a, a fund? I know you, you've been, uh, uh, you've had equity personally in businesses, but have you invested alongside a fund? I have not. I have not. And I wouldn't say that's for any specific reason. Uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about the access these funds 
in this episode. But the way that I've done it is is probably the riskier way, which is actually just going out and trying to, to source deals by myself, um, a habit of, of, of a bit of adventure. But, you know, it's the same as how we say never pick a stock, right? Of course we all do, but <laughs> historically and mathematically going out and picking stocks is a really bad idea. What you want to do is, is as we always preach is to diversify across broad indexes and get as much, much exposure to different asset classes and, and, uh, and, uh, regions as possible markets as possible. And it's the same with venture capital, you know, going out and picking five different companies or one different company is typically a bad idea. You're going to, you're much better off if you go out and invest across uh, a broad portfolio of those. But for most people that access is very difficult. Now there's never a better time to be involved in venture. And the numbers prove themselves as all asset classes are going up. Venture deals are just ridiculous right now. We just posted a chart in the boss lounge that shows the difference in funding levels from just 2020 to 2021 over the different quarters. And the pre-seed rounds, the seed round series A, B, C, and D, the the, the change in the the valuations have, have just gone incredibly <laughs> inflated. Now, whether we're in a bubble or not, that's not not my business to say. But what I can say is if you're an early stage investor and you're involved in venture capital or you're a founder and you're raising money, there is no better time to be in the biz. And what Sweater is doing is they are they're bringing this, the, this uh, asset class to people on a whole new level. Uh, I'm really excited about this episode, but I'm more excited about the platform and what they're building because this is something that everybody needs access to. You know, we, we're all, we all have access to crypto, which is the most speculative, volatile asset class that you could possibly be in if you call it an asset. Why wouldn't everyone be able to have as, uh, access to venture capital? It's never made sense to me, right? So Sweater's doing this. Um, I think we're going to learn out learned about a, a, a very interesting asset class that they are bringing to the people um, and bringing, you know, like, like we've never had access to before. And I think it's going to be really quite interesting. Derek, how did you find, uh, how'd you find Jesse to come on to the episode? You know, what's really random. So I should, I should forewarn everybody that sweater is not quite open yet to investors. They're in the very last stages of approval with the SEC and they already have 43,000 people on the wait list. So I think that just speaks to Sam, Sam's thoughts that there's so much money in this market and everybody th that cannot get in wants to get in the fact that they're not even open to the public yet. And they have 43,000 people waiting. I saw they have a really good marketing campaign that I just started seeing. And they had this really intriguing video, which actually, you know what? I'll post it on the site so everybody can check it out. It's pretty funny. And I was like, I got to talk to these guys. So <laughs> I reached out and I actually, I think I got in touch with the COO. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now. And I was like, hey, you know what? I just, I want to talk to you guys. And he goes, you know what? I think, I think you got to talk to our CEO, Jesse. And that's just kind of how it, it naturally came up. I actually just saw it on the internet after I accepted all the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Cookies, cookies. What goes better with Vega Cecilia than a macadamia nut cookie? Anyways, Ooh. I don't want to spoil the episode. I got a lot more to talk about, but let's save it for the intro. Now, let's get the episode started. Let's hear from Jesse and Derek on Sweater Ventures. This week's sponsor of Invest Like a Boss is Fundrise. Now, in 2021, a truly diversified portfolio needs to include private real estate. That's where Fundrise comes in. Fundrise provides access to diversified portfolios of private real estate to all investors, whether you're accredited or not, with their industry-leading, easy-to-use platform. Whether you're looking to add some stable cash flow via dividends or you prefer long-term growth, Fundrise makes it easy as investors investing in stocks, bonds, or mutual funds. Now, I personally use Fundrise as well. It's so easy. Every single week, I add to my account, and they send me updates about all these projects that they're in. Whether it's big or small, you get to find out about these deals, and it's really cool. It makes you feel a part of the process, yet you don't have to do any of the tough work. So it's like a win-win situation. So if you want to see for yourself how 150,000 investors have built a better portfolio with private real estate, it just just takes a second to get started. Go to fundrise 
fundrise.com slash like a boss. That's fundrise.com slash like a boss. I'll spell it out for you. F U N D R I S E dot com slash like a boss. All right, back here on Invest Like a Boss. I'm talking to the CEO of Sweater Ventures. His name is Jesse Randall. Jesse, thank you for joining the show. Derek, it's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, I think this is a really great fit with our audience. I I love these new platforms that are all coming out because I've said it a hundred times. Our biggest request on the show is, I love this investment you're talking about, but I'm not able to invest in it because I'm not accredited or... Um, any other number of reasons, but the biggest thing is not being accredited. And it sounds like you guys solve an issue in a world where venture capital is specifically for the accredited investor or the multi multi millionaire. Uh, Can you kind of speak to the inspiration behind sweater ventures and how you're allowing venture capital to be, uh, I guess, allowed to be invested in by the masses? Yeah. Well, how about I give you just the, the quick, you know, like maybe one minute, overview of what sweater is. So everybody has context and then I'll, I'll kind of tell you how we got here. Is that all right? Sure. Let's do it. <clears throat> yeah. So sweater's objective, like you said, is to open up the venture capital fund asset class to the public. So venture capital funds in particular are extraordinarily exclusive. Um, really to get into one, you have to be able to write half a million dollar check or more uh, to be able to participate. And it's excluded to those that are really ultra wealthy, right? And can be able to cut checks like that. I mean, personally, I don't know about you. I, I can't cut a half million dollar check into anything. Yeah. And, you got to give me a few days to cut that check. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got to, got to move some stuff around. Right. <laughs> uh, but the reality is most of us just can't do that. And uh, yet the, the venture capital fund uh, category is invested in all the, the highest returning assets in the last 50 years. You know, everything from from Google to Apple way back in the day to stuff like Airbnb and Stripe that's happening today right before our eyes. And you and I just can't participate, uh, you know, if we're if we're kind of small time investors. And so Sweater's objective is to open that category up so that anybody can invest. We're doing that through a mobile app, which is a lot like Robinhood, uh, except it's for private venture backed companies instead of public equities and and crypto and what have you. Um, And on our side, it's all fully managed or professionally managed, just like a a regular VC fund is. So you put your money in uh, alongside lots of other regular folks. We pull all that money together. And then we go out and professionally manage a deal pipeline. We do due diligence on opportunities. We invest in those companies. We follow them and support them until they mature and one day exit or IPO so that that those returns can come back to you as a member of the fund. And we take care of everything for you. Uh, it's it's a super simple and easy experience. And one of the reasons we wanted to make it a mobile app is to kind of give you that feeling of having courtside seats to the whole process, right? You don't get to shoot the ball. You don't get to coach the team. But we will give you that that tour of the locker room. We'll let you have, like, hear interviews from the players, knowing that you are a part owner of the team that's playing in front of you. And that's the whole experience that Sweater wanted to set up from day one, uh, was to be able to level that playing field and give everybody equal access to this incredible asset class. Sure. So you mentioned Robin Hood and you're kind of talking about you, you want to be a member of the game and, and a lot of maybe criticism or praise for Robin Hood is that it's, it's more the gamification of trading. Is, would you kind of consider this the gamification of jumping into venture capital? What, uh, what kind of experience do you get other than just uh, putting your money in and setting and forgetting it? What, what are you experiencing on the app? Yeah, well, I'd say we're definitely staying far away from anything that could be classified as gamification. Uh, but we do want you to feel like you know what's going on. We want you to hear the stories of the founders and hearing about the things that they're going through. We want you to be educated and understand how the, the asset class works, how, how ventures are built, how all of this stuff um, actually coalesces together in this ecosystem to be able to create all the value and, and the cool innovation that we see around us. You know, And part of that right, is our ability to also be able to provide education and make sure that you're well oriented into uh, how all this stuff works. Um, And, you know, within that, there's really an opportunity for you to be able to have things to talk about on the weekends. You know, it's funny because as we've talked to people, so we've got 33,000 people, excuse me, 43,000 people on the wait list now. And as we examine that, it's interesting to understand people's motivations because on one side, I mean, of course, there's the opportunity to get into this incredible asset class and be able to make returns in a way that's been previously exclusive. But as you dig in and understand people's mentality, the other half is really, you know, kind of entertainment and status driven. You know, they want something to talk about on the weekends when they're hanging out with their friends at the bar, sure. you know, you, uh, and, and you want to be able to kind of have that, 
that badge on your shoulder that you're an investor, right? It does something for your standing amongst your peers. And so th there's this whole other side, right? Where I wouldn't call it gamification, but it's really just involvement in the process and understanding what's going on and all that. That totally makes sense. So it seems like you're one of the one of the first out, out of the gate for these uh, non-accredited investors to to get involved in the startup world and venture capital. Can you tell us about any competition that's out there and how Sweater uh, is setting themselves apart? Yeah, so I think it depends on whose uh, shoes you're standing in. So if you're talking about non-accredited investors, which basically is anybody that makes less than 200 grand a year and has less than a million dollars in uh, net assets outside the value of their home, is kind of the definition of a credit investor, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. So that's like 95% of US households are not accredited, just for the record. So for all of us that fall into that category, there really aren't very many options. The, pretty much the only thing you can do is you can participate in what's called equity crowdfunding through um, platforms like Republic or uh, WeFunder or Start Engine that are out there. And those are great platforms. They, they've allowed uh, individuals who are not accredited go in and invest directly into individual companies. But the difference there is that most of those companies that you find on those platforms aren't venture qualified is what we call it. Meaning that if they wanted to go raise money from venture capital funds, venture capital funds probably wouldn't give them money because they don't meet the deal criteria and the growth requirement criteria for a VC fund to be able to back them. And so they're great companies and we're grateful that that market is there because all kinds of founders are able to get some funding in the doors to be able to do what they need to, but they're not necessarily, uh, they're just a different category than the venture backable companies that are out there. So um, when you get into that, you really have to do a lot of heavy lifting yourself as a regular person. You got to go in and go through all the lists of companies that are listed there. Uh, you have to determine whether or not you think it's a good investment, conduct your own due diligence. Uh, beyond that, if you actually want to get your money out of it, you need to make at least 30 investments and create your own portfolio mm -hmm. so that your risk is diversified. And most people just don't feel comfortable doing any of that. And so, um, you know, by contrast, you look at us and everything is, is put together for you. You put your money in and you kind of set it and forget it. We take care of all the deal flow. We do all the due diligence. Everything's professionally managed. We report back to you on the app and we automatically build that portfolio on your behalf. And we invest in hundreds of companies, not just uh, you know a couple of dozen. So from that perspective, that's pretty much the only way as a, as a non-accredited investor that you can get involved. If you are accredited, there are some other avenues you can go to. You can invest into companies through AngelList. You can participate in syndicates and rolling funds. Uh, if you write a bigger size check, or if you've got a buddy that's running a venture fund, you could actually put money into a VC fund, but that's usually pretty rare uh, and very difficult to get into. So there's some of those options that are out there, but generally speaking, there just aren't very many options. It's still a, a, a pretty, uh, I wouldn't call it secretive, but it's a, it's a very much a handshake and who you know kind of a world, it's kind of an old boys club. Sure, that's kind of the, the experience I, I've seen as well. And it's really interesting that you brought up the fact that these crowdfunding platforms are maybe companies that, that were picked over by the VCs and passed on because we recently had a company on that was running a start engine campaign and they were having problems raising funds even on start engine. So I think that's a really interesting point that if a company is on one of these crowdfunding platforms, it's probably because a VC fund had already passed on them. Yeah. And I, I definitely don't want to like knock on any company or any founders that are raising money through that channel. Uh, you know, there, there are a handful on there that choose to not take venture money and to go raise from the crowd instead. And it's difficult to tell which ones are like that and which ones just couldn't qualify for it. And that's, that's part of the trick of the game. If you're going to play in that world is understanding the difference. Yeah. Um, and it, it's nuanced. It's really hard. I mean, even as a professional investor, I go in there and I'm like, you know, I, I don't know whether or not this one would be qualified from a VC's perspective. So yeah, it, it's, it's difficult and it's very nuanced. And you have not officially accepted any investors on, on Sweater yet, correct? Yeah, we're in the final stages of uh, registering everything with the SEC. Uh, matter of fact, we're, as we say, we're on like the two yard line after driving the ball all the way down the field. It's just a formality at this part, at this point, but we can't, you know, move the process any faster than the SEC wants to move. Well, so, let's, hope, uh, let's hope you're not like my uh, Minnesota Vikings because you'll never get it in the end zone. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ouch. All right. Sorry. Yeah, I had to get yeah. that in there. Um, <laughs> I believe in you guys. <laughs> so uh, you, you said you have 43,000 people on the wait list. That's incredible. Is there going to be any kind of limiting to the amount of investors you can bring in? Cause I'm, I'm assuming there's gonna be a cap of 75 million on the fund. Uh, you can speak to that better, I guess. Yeah, no, actually with, with the, uh, 
the fund designation that we have with the SEC, we don't have any limits on the number of investors we can have or the amount of funding that we can uh, gather. So we're not operating oh, right. for okay. Reg A plus, which is probably what you had in mind with that 75 million. Yep. Um, yeah, we can go well beyond that. We could bring in 500 million. We could we could raise you know 500 billion over 30 years. Uh, so the fund is evergreen in nature, which changes the dynamics of how we operate it, how we deploy capital, the strategy around building out the portfolio that's that's underlying, how we spin up new funds in the future uh, that are more around themes. I mean, all kinds of things. It's actually a ton of fun to dive into. Awesome. So let's talk about who can invest with Sweater. Uh, obviously, you said you don't need to be accredited to invest in Sweater. Um, what about someone who is accredited? Is there any kind of advantage for an accredited investor? Or are they treated just the same as a non-accredited? Yeah, that's a great thing. I mean, think of it, this is kind of like, uh, it's almost like a cousin to a mutual fund. So, you know, when you put your money in, you're, you're pretty much treated the same as everybody else. And, you know, we did that on purpose. We believe that the little guys should have the same access as the big guys. And so as an accredited investor, your money is right alongside non-accredited investors and also alongside institutional investors that will come in um, writing much larger checks. And so, uh, you know, when we look at the breakdowns, we look at really three major categories of uh, investors that will be coming in. And so the first one is, you know, accredited, and you're talking about like, you know, doctors and attorneys and, um, you know, and consultants and folks that live a very uh, fast paced lifestyle that make a lot of money. You know, we have probably, you know, a hundred doctors just wrapped around some of the, the folks that came in our, in our initial seed round who want to throw in a hundred thousand dollars and sign up for a couple thousand dollars a month because, you know, they're an orthopedic surgeon and they make 700 grand a year. And they're just looking somewhere to put their money consistently where they don't have to think about it. So you've got that whole category, which is really interesting. And, um, and they'll come in in droves, you know, and we're excited about that. Um, the other one that we, uh, that kind of falls in the middle, um, we refer to as um, Henry's uh, high earners, not rich yet. So they usually make between okay. hundred, two hundred $250,000 a year, um, aren't really accredited. Uh, they might be, but probably not, or they're riding the edge, um, usually like way, in sure. their late twenties, early thirties, you know, like through their thirties, maybe early forties. Um, and the interesting thing about this group is that they're kind of known, at least in the marketing community as um, spending most of their money because sure. they're often seeking status, you know, so they might spend 1200 bucks on a Gucci purse or, you know, whatever the case may be, um, or blowing all their money on travel and stuff like that, because they're, you know, creating a lifestyle image. And the interesting thing about sweater inside that category is that, Sweater is, is in a way almost like the ultimate status image because you're making yourself an investor. And so there's this interesting mentality. It's almost like they feel like they're spending their money to get the status they get elsewhere, but it's actually an investment that's going to make them money. And so it's, it's kind of an interesting group to work with in that regard. And then the other one, you know, they're just, uh, it's the group that's like pushing hard to change the system. Um, usually, uh, you know, making between 50, 100K a year. Uh, you know, educated, want to see the system change or often very heavily involved in crypto or in other groups like Wall Street Bets to try to see things through and, and want to be treated equally. And those groups will write smaller checks and we want them around because they're enthusiastic and they want to see things change. Awesome. Makes sense. So do investors need to be a U.S. citizen? Out of the gates, yes. So the fund will be registered in the United States, uh, but we expect to launch probably to Singapore and the U.K. within 24 months of launch. Okay, great. We got we got listeners from all over the world, but as long as we know that maybe you know you guys are working on it in the future, I think that's good to know. Uh, yeah. What, and what eventually, kind of I mean, eventually we'll register in a lot more countries as well. I mean, we we intend to have this initial fund to be the flagship fund, and we want people from anywhere in the world to be able to invest into it. And what's kind of a cool concept in thinking about this fund being registered in other countries is that it's uh, citizens of those countries get to participate and benefit from the venture movement and growth in the U.S. venture market, right? Um, right. Which is kind of cool because otherwise, I mean, you, you really can't get into venture deals here in the U.S. if you're located outside the U.S., unless maybe you're already part of a fund. But, you know, for my friends in Singapore and in, uh, in China and Germany and wherever else, right, they, they'll be able to come put their money in and benefit from all the cool innovation happening here. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, what, are, what are the investment minimums going to be uh, once the fund has opened? Yeah, we, we want to make it as low as possible. So um, minimum initial investment is $500. Wow. Okay, great. And then uh, we got to talk about the fees. So what type of fees is, is Sweater going to take on, on your investment? Yeah, so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's kind of two categories of fees. One is a management fee um, that's paid back to Sweater to actually operate the fund. It's a flat 2% management fee that just goes on forever. Um, and then there's a, a layer of administration 
kind of fees that are based on the actual deals that we conduct. So um, there's a marketing layer that, that covers the, the ability for us to go out and actually find everyone as members and bring them into the funds to invest. And then there's a the cost of cutting deals with you know legal and accounting oversight, like that sort of thing to actually audit the fund and make sure that we're in compliance with the SEC is kind of the other layers that are on there. So it's straightforward. And you know with this kind of an asset class, it's way more human capital intensive than say, you know, um, you know, working with your, your broker that's, you know, running your, your overall portfolio account and your brokerage account. Um, because, you know, we can't click a button and move uh, $50 million into this stock today on behalf of 10,000 clients that are a part of XYZ, right? Um, we actually have sure. to go out and find our deal flow. We have to talk to these founders. We have to make sure everything is, you know, accurate about how we're all seeing the future together. We have to um, be able to pull all those deals across the line and work with legal to make them happen. And then we got to take care of them for a decade, you know? So there's a lot more that goes into it. And I mean, I'll be the first to say that sweater itself is, you know, we are aiming to put everything we can back into the company to continue to keep it to grow. You know, like this, this is not like my compensation structure is the person running the fund and starting the company is not the same compensation structure as someone like Mark Andreessen that runs Andreessen Horowitz or whoever the, you know, celebrity VC might be. Um, sure. That kind of ups upside is not built into it for me on a personal level. We're looking at this as a community thing and how we can create the biggest impact possible. And are, are there any other type of fees like when Sweater will exit a company or maybe a, a company gets acquired or goes public? Are there any type of uh, exit fees on that? No, no. So that's typically called a carry. Um, and within the this initial fund, we're not going to be taking any carry. So um, all the winning basically goes back into driving the value of the fund. So to give you a little bit more context on that, it actually feels like when, when you buy into to the sweater fund, it feels like you're buying a stock. So uh, it's a unit called NAV or net asset value. And mm -hmm. that NAV is a price point for buying a unit in the fund. So on day one, that you know, NAV might be at 20 bucks. You want to put in $1,000 bam, you own 50 units inside the sweater fund. So as we aggregate small checks from all these individual people, we go out and find opportunities. We make investments in companies. Those companies grow and eventually get acquired or IPO one day. Then the NAV goes from $20 to 22 to 27 to whatever, right? And that's mm -hmm. how you realize your gains in the fund over time. It's really easy to go into the app and see, oh yeah, you know, I, I put in a thousand bucks. It's worth 1500 bucks now. That's awesome. And it's very easy for us to communicate the value of what's going on inside the portfolio to all of our members. Sure. And then how long would the hold time have to be on this? Can, can you exit out after a year, six months? Do you have, is it, a, is it a, obviously a long-term investment, but is there any type of penalty if you want to exit early and what's the minimum hold time? Yeah, excellent question. So this is one of the really unique things about Sweater compared to the broader venture community. Uh, Lockup periods for t traditional venture, you're usually told plan on 12 to 15 years is what they tell you now. Um, and at that point, you really don't have any say about being able to take any money out of the fund in a traditional sense. You're waiting for, you only get money back out if a company has an exit and then you get a check. Uh, but within the way Sweater operates, um, we have what we call redemption windows, where every six months we open up a window where you can request a portion or even all of your position out of the fund if you needed to at whatever the nav is at that point in time or the price of the fund, right? So um, and, we open and no up these windows And no six. additional penalty on top of that? You, you'll get the actual nav price? Uh, yes, except for within the first 24 months. Then there's slight uh, penalties associated with doing it within six months, within 12 months, within 24 months. I'd have to go look in the prospectus to see exactly what it is, but it's not enormous. It's just enough to be like, well, we don't want you coming in and out of the fund super fast, right? Because this isn't a get rich Chris Crick scheme. You know, I mean, this right. is a long-term investment. If you're investing in sweater, we want you to have a 10 to 15 year outlook on it. Same way you look at your IRA and your 401k. But if you have to, or if you need to, we do have these redemption windows that you can access a portion or all of your investment if you have to. And that was actually the most important part of the discussion that we had with the SEC. Um, we, when we first approached them, our, uh, I guess our theory was we wanted to reduce risk as much as possible inside the asset class. And when we talked to them about it, they, they surprised us and said, yeah, well, you know, risk, risk is important, but that's not our number one priority. Our number one priority is liquidity or the ability for people to access their money if they have to. Sure. Um, you know, if grandma dies and someone's got to pay 10 grand for a funeral, we want them to be able to get to their money in a reasonable amount of time. So 
yeah, it's that's one of the things that's so different. So if somebody comes in and, and drops in a grand or 10 grand or whatever, and six months later is like, hey, I'm out of here, you can do that. But there's there's going to be a slight penalty associated with pulling your money out super fast. Let's let's talk about your strategy and what and uh, what kind of companies that that sweater is going to target once you are actually open. Uh, mm-hmm. Basically, uh, which, which stage companies are, are you really looking at to target in this fund? Yeah. So let me st- step back and, and tell you about I'll tell you about stage in just a second. Um, there's something interesting about the way that we build the portfolio of sweater. So if you just step back, like way, way back for a second and just bear with me, there's two sides to sweater, right? So on one side, there's us going out and raising capital, finding investors and members to come and put money into the fund itself, right? So there's that whole thing. That's all the technology, all the marketing, all that fun stuff. The other side of the house is capital deployment. And that is us finding companies, investing in companies and all that kind of stuff. So on the capital deployment side of the house, it, we operate differently than a traditional fund because of that evergreen nature that I mentioned earlier, meaning that we can basically take money and um, be able to take new investors at any time all the way into the future for as long as we keep the fund open. A traditional fund usually has uh, is pre-raising money. So they pre-raise, say, $100 million, and then they usually have about three years to deploy that money. And then they go raise another fund and they do the whole thing again. But for us, we're more like matching cash coming in against a pipeline of companies that we're investing in and they match each other all the way into the future. And we're not raising different funds, so to speak. So because of that, that really long-term view of what we're able to do, we're not going to make, you know, 30 investments like a traditional fund would do. We can make 300 or we can make 3000. And because of that, that allows us to think differently about how we construct the portfolio and put the whole thing together. Um, And in this case, you know, when you're making hundreds or thousands of investments like that, there's a whole category called large portfolio theory. And it's important to understand that because it affects the way that we are able to look at individual companies. So if we talk about the types of companies and the stages of companies that we invest in, there's uh, one criteria that never moves no matter what. And we call that venture qualified. And that basically means kind of going back to the idea when we were talking about equity crowdfunding earlier, venture qualified is that you meet all the criteria to be able to have venture level returns uh, should your company find success when you execute according to what we all, you know, together believe the future potential of the company is, right? So if your company could only ever grow up and and do five or 10 million in revenue, that's probably not venture qualified. But if it has the potential to do 100 million, 500 million or billions in revenue with the right support and the correct execution, that's the kind of level of company that that we are always going to be looking at. So that's rule number one, no matter what the stage. Now, you step back into that and say, now, what stages do we want to invest into? There's three categories of of investments that we can move money into. So we can do direct investments and we'll be doing that in early stage. So that's between pre-seed and series B. So pre-seed, seed, seed, series A and series B, we'll be able to make direct investments. That's us leading opportunities, working directly with founders. That's us also co-investing with other venture capital funds to make deals happen. These are like the the types of things that you, you know, rounds that you see popping up inside the news and all that kind of stuff. When XYZ company has raised $50 million, We'll be part of deals like that. Uh, The other place that we can make investments is in a category called secondaries or secondary purchases, which basically means these are late stage companies for us. So series C all the way up until a company IPOs where we can go in and actually buy shares away from founders. And as they say, take some chips off the table for them. So that means that money is not going into the company to fund it. It's actually going to the founder or the early employee who's selling us their shares. And so they're able to take a little bit of money off the table and whatever. And then we kind of come in through the back door kind of, and there are a bunch of marketplaces we can participate in that stuff in, or we can go in and strike a deal directly with the founders of a company and make that happen. So that's our late stage strategy. And then we can allocate a small percentage directly into other VC funds, actually. So we could go and take a, a position in a VC fund and put $5 million into a fund manager that we really believe in. And then that gives us access to co-invest alongside all their deals. Um, and get exposure to everything that they ever do. So those are the three big categories in general. Cool. That totally makes sense. So obviously, when when you think about venture capital, you think about tech companies, you think about Silicon Valley, things of that nature. Is that going to be the main focus of this fund? Or are there any any other particular sectors that uh, maybe excite you and are beyond just straight up tech that that really interests you in, in this venture capital mm-hmm. world? Oh, wow. We could talk about this all day. <laughs> so there's this... <laughs> there's uh, uh, I guess a database called PitchBook that classifies all types of venture deals. And I think they have 56 different categories um, of venture deals, right? 
And so we went and picked that apart and we're actually interested, I think in 42 of the 56. So in the way that we look at it, we call it um, consumer touching. Um, and so it's basically anything that us as you know, regular consumers could encounter or be able to engage with in our everyday life, whether at home or at work, you know, with our families, that sort of thing. So anything that's like direct consumer products, any type of technology that you might find on your phone or marketplaces that you might access, uh, all the way into things that you might engage with and interact with at work, right? So it could be Slack or it could be, you know, a backend system like Gusto or whatever else that you could you know, just have natural interaction with. So that's the main focus out of the gates, you know, pretty much we're staying away from areas um, like biotech and, you know, medical devices and okay. industrial applications and things like that. But eventually we'll open up other categories too, you know, like we'll eventually, I'm sure like most others will have some kind of crypto related fund. You know, mm -hmm. we'll probably end up doing something with NFTs one day, um, you know, as we examine what else is out there and as things start to mature around climate tech, that's probably an area we'll get into We'll definitely end up creating something around impact um, and have an impact focused fund that people can allocate part of their money to. Um, and, you know, just in general, I guess that that's, you know, a, a, a kind of a good segue into talking about the future of sweater, right? Like we're starting with one fund. It's called the Sweater Cashmere Fund. And it's this consumer touching, you know, kind of all purpose fund that's going to live forever. But in the future, as we get enough money inside that fund, we're going to start spinning up other funds too. And those funds are themed funds. So they'll have an individual focus like crypto or like, being an impact funder like climate tech or like late stage or just international companies. And you can start as a member of Sweater starting to allocate your dollars into themed funds that reflect your interests in the world. So um, an individual and, a divest, I'm sorry, an individual investor will be able to decide, I'm really interested in crypto. I want to be in the crypto fund. I want to be in this fund. I want to be in that fund eventually. Exactly, right. And then within each fund, like those funds are each professionally managed. So you as an individual won't say, hey, I want my money to go into this company and not that company. You know, that's not the level of relationship, but you can say, I do want to be in that fund, in that fund, in that fund. Sure. So th I, that's actually what I was going to bring up too. I was wondering if, do individual investors get any type of say in what companies that you are investing in? Or do you, do you even just take suggestions and then your team maybe vets out a certain company? But obviously you can't pick an individual company and say, I want my money to go in that. But do you take feedback from investors saying, you know, you guys should, you guys should check this company out or that company out? Oh, yeah, yeah. We would be stupid not to. And that's actually one of the reasons we consider ourselves uh, a technology company first that just happens to be operating an underlying venture fund is because our ability to tap into our, our retail investor base to gain wisdom and insights into where the world is heading is going to be our biggest competitive advantage over the next decade. So, you know, like, I mean, imagine our, our future state, we've got 500,000 members. We're not just going to like send them cool videos and say, hey, you know, here's some entertainment. This is what's happening in the portfolio. Part of what we're building is actually the ability for us to be able to tap into them, understand everything about them, understand their hobbies, what they do for work, the things that ail them in their life, you know, all that kind of stuff so that we can be smart and be able to tap into them for insights as well as for distributing product from the companies we invest in. So as an example, um, it's kind of a personal example. So and it's something that's maybe nuanced to kind of get your, you know, your imagination flowing. Um, my dad has Alzheimer's. And so, um, you know, we are going through a very specific thing as a family trying to figure out this whole situation. And so something that we could do within Sweater is like, oh, we're looking at this company that is providing a technology platform for families that are managing Alzheimer's within their four walls, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can go, oh, that's interesting. And we go into their database and say, boop, 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 uh, how many people indicated that they're managing Alzheimer's? Oh, we've got 17,000 people that are, are dealing with this. Let's ask them some questions. And we're not gonna pitch the company to them. What we're gonna do instead is ask them how they're managing this, what technologies they're using, where the shortcomings are. If they had a magic wand and could solve their problem any way they wanted, how would they do it? And start getting insights from people to sure. inform us as to whether or not this company we're looking at actually has something going on or not, right? And then let's just assume that we think it's a great idea. We make an investment in that company. Now we've got 17,000 people who are potential buyers who have a financial incentive to help this company be successful because they're investors in the company, right? So there's this two-way street that helps us be very, very smart about the way that we go about um, investing and distributing product and helping our companies get through the most critical phases, which is really between the pre-seed and that series B, are the hardest and most risky portions of a, of a company's life cycle. And it's our belief that we can accelerate them through that with less risk because of the technology that we're building. I, I think that's really smart to, to survey your community to, to kind of 
uh, vet some of these companies to to get a sample case for that. That's that's really smart. Uh, can you walk us through the vetting process that Sweater does to decide on which companies to invest in? Obviously, you know, you said you talk to your community oh, yeah. and things of that nature. I guess where does it start uh, from finding a company to deciding? Okay, it's time to invest into it. Oh yeah, yeah. So there's all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so for us, I mean, there's a few different categories uh, for us. Let's talk about finding deals, vetting deals, and then supporting deals after we've made investment. So in terms of finding deals, right? I mean, there's opportunities, um, you know, for us to go out and, and be able to do a few different things. So the first level is we have VC partnerships that we're focused on. So we've got about 25 partners across the country right now that operate VC funds who want to do deals alongside of us. So we bring them opportunities that we see, they bring us opportunities they see, and then we can co-invest on opportunities that we both mutually like together. And that's a great channel. We'll, we'll eventually grow that to having hundreds of VC partners across the country. Um, the other thing that, we, that we're doing is really kind of, as they say, creating our own weather, <laughs> which is us being proactive and going out into the world uh, so that we can control our own destiny. And one of those is that, you know, we're obviously a direct consumer company. So we're going to be spending tons of money, um, you know, to bring people in and get the word out about sweater and build trust with the public. So that people want to come and invest in sweater. And as part of that, a natural reaction is going to be entrepreneurs hearing about us loving sweater and then wanting us to invest in their company. So we'll have all kinds of inbound opportunities coming in. The flip side of that is our ability to go out into the world proactively and, um, uh, and actually go out and find opportunities. And we do that through an organized scout network that we have. So we've actually got a hundred scouts right now spread across the country that are actively looking for deals. And our, our goal on that is to always have 1% of our member base be scouts out there looking for things where we train them. We help them understand what a good deal looks like, allow them to go out and build relationships with founders. Because I mean, our belief is that, you know, uh, you know, we're democratizing access, asset, access to the asset class, but we also want to democratize access to the actual, you know, um, I guess, deal-making process and, uh, and opportunity process of finding companies as well. Because every amazing founder that's out there has that, that cousin, that former roommate, that colleague they used to work with who knows what they're working on before it ever hits the wire, right? Sure. And that's all of us. That's us as regular people. And so it's just organizing that and teaching them what to look for so they can bring them to us. So I love, I love the, the main ed education ways. aspect of it and sharing with the community uh, the whole process. Cause I think for a long time, this has kind of felt like a, a secret world that, that wasn't accessible to most oh, people. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, and that's just a funny thing, right? I mean, it's, uh, I think venture capitalists have made it sound like this is a really, really hard and complicated game. And in many ways it is, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. going to try to talk down to anybody, you know, but, at the same time, it's also kind of programmatic. And if you ask me, this is my take on it. Venture is hard. Finding good deals is hard. But most of venture and success in venture is based on luck. You got into this deal that you never thought would explode that ended up returning your entire fund, right? Sure. And, you know, how did you get that deal? Oh, well, just someone just happened to mention it and you got in at the last minute and whatever else, right? I mean, it's like the, I think a lot of VCs, like to project into the world that they control everything and that they have this, this God view of the way the world is going to be. Um, when really, I think it comes down to the quality of your deal flow. So if you took if to someone like Andreessen Horowitz that has a, you know, just amazing world-class deal flow, you took all the opportunities that they see every year and you come hand it to a, a local regional VC fund that's here in, in Denver and say, hey, go through all these companies and you pick the winners. Guaranteed, they're going to also create amazing returns because right. <laughs> the deals they're looking at are amazing, right? Yep. And so the quality of your deal flow is more determinant than how smart you are behind the curtain saying that I like this deal over that deal. And that's one of the things we want to create is the ability to increase the quality of our deal flow over time in such a way that we just naturally are seeing the best companies and that those companies align with our mission and what we stand for and that they want to take money from Sweater. Great. And can, can you share with our audience how, how these investments are structured? Are, are they just straight up equity, convertible debt, um, et cetera? Any other kind of type of ways that these investments are usually structured? If you could just kind of break down how your money is going into these companies for our audience. Yeah, absolutely. So it, inside the venture world, the difference between venture and a lot of different asset classes is that venture investments actually take a portion of ownership in the company that you're investing in. And there's a bunch of different ways that that ownership can happen. So you mentioned, you know, actually getting on the cap table, taking shares directly, right? So as a as sweater, you know, we're looking at a great company, we might invest $5 million and we get a 10% stake in what they're doing in the future. 
And after that point, a lot of things can happen that change the, the nature of our investment. But at the end of the day, we own a portion of that company. So if they went from being worth 30 million to being sold for 300 million, then we get a big return coming off of that because we actually own part of it. Um, so that can happen in a bunch of different ways. There's convertible notes, there's safes, there's direct investments that, that can all happen. Um, eventually, you know, we might launch something like venture debt, where which is becoming a very common way to be able to leverage um, the cash flows that a company already has and, and give away less of the company. Uh, and you know, as it all goes down, at the end of the day, we're going to be very flexible and we will adapt ourselves to the way that deal making shifts and changes into the future. Because I think I have this nagging feeling that cryptocurrency um, and, and DAOs and other types of structures are going to be disruptive in this space in the five to 10 year time frame, And you can guarantee that we'll be involved in all those evolutions. That makes sense. So since the fund has not officially started yet, I'm assuming that you're not able to invest in any companies yet, correct? That's right. Yeah. So we'll start making investments in Q1 next year. So do you have, I know a lot of these, a lot of these venture deals will move fast. I've been told, you know, you know we got we to gotta close this in two weeks or whatever it may be. Do you have companies on the radar already, or can you not even really get to that stage yet until you have final SEC approval? Do you have deals just ready to go day one? Well, yeah, yeah. So there, there's a lot of strategy going into that. Um, so with the scouts that we have across the country, we've already looked at about 150 opportunities in the last 60 days. Okay. Um, we've identified 25 or 30 that we feel like have really high potential. Um, and so we're nurturing those relationships and staying close. And, you know, when the time comes, we'll dive into deeper due diligence and really finalize a lot of these opportunities. But one of the things that's, um, that's important to note too, like it's, it's our belief that the first, you know, 10 or 15 investments that we make are going to be extraordinarily important, uh, for everyone to get a feel for what we're doing. So when we launch, we're not necessarily just going to start like writing checks in January, right? Sure. We're going to be looking at a broad spectrum. And looking at these first 15 or 20 deals that we do and making sure that we have world-class opportunities in front of us to lay as the foundation for the entire fund moving forward. And that's going to be a, a fun game to play, but it's also one where our initial investors, we're going to say, hey, have patience and hey, give us a hand too. Like, who do you know that uh, is building an incredible company that, that can let us in on, on what's going on? Um, you know, as a retail base that's out there, we understand that people like to see uh, brands that they may recognize out in the everyday world. And that typically is later stage companies, right? Right. You're not always going to, to notice. Like, I mean, if you went back to 2009 and you saw an advertisement for Airbnb listed on Craigslist, you wouldn't have thought twice I'd about have no it, idea right? What you're because talking you, about. <laughs> yeah, like what, what's going on, right? But to have been able to get in on uh, you know, a late stage round or some secondaries uh, on Airbnb in 2017, that would have been amazing, right? Everyone would have right. been like, oh my gosh, Airbnb. And so there, there's a lot of that where I think, you know, uh, it's one of those areas of education that we're going to make sure that we do a good job of inside the app experience is understanding the stages and uh, of where companies are and the amount of potential that's left inside those companies based on, you know, some of these elements that we kind of have preconceived notions about how well we might know that company when the investment's made. And so there's a lot of that that's just kind of fun. But yeah, those first, you know, 15, 20 deals are going to be fun to do. That makes sense. So since you're since you're going to be a brand new fund and a lot of these are early stage companies, you said, you know, this is a long term investment. You should plan on minimum two years to have your money in there, but it, it, you should more look at the, the 10 to 15 year range. So how long should investors mm -hmm. really anticipate waiting before seeing any type of meaningful return, knowing that, you know, you're a brand new fund, these are early companies and it's going to take time? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the nice things about having the nav that we're tracking is that we're always looking at the underlying value of the portfolio at any given point in time. So it's not like you're putting your money in and then you're waiting five years and you're like, oh, look, something happened, a company sold, and now the fund is growing in value. It doesn't happen like that. It's actually much more gradual. So as the companies that are underlying are making progress and are raising future funding rounds and things like that, but they're still private, we're going to be reflecting all of that activity in the price of the NAV. So you know, over the course of the first year, you know, the NAV may go from, I don't know, $20 on day one to being $23, right? On at the end of 365 days, which mm -hmm. doesn't seem like much, but that's actually, you know, 15% annualized return, right? So I think that as you look at that, one thing that we want very clearly for everyone to understand is that this is not crypto, right? We're, we're not doing some, you know, GameStop moments where we're pumping and dumping, you know, we're not doing like, this is not a get rich fast scheme, right? This is a 
look at a 10 year horizon, investing in real companies that have huge growth potential and saying, we are going to outperform the market in general is the, is the objective. And we're going to do that over a long period of time and do better than what you would do. You know, the goal is to do better than what you would do out in the public markets. Um, you know, and for us, like we have to be careful how we talk about those things because of our registration status with the SEC. But I think when you look at, and this is another part of the education, you look at the overall VC market in general and how it breaks down and the types of returns that are possible. And we want to be in the great return side of that whole world, but that does take time, right? And so you could go in and like put in $10,000 and come back and, you know, 36 months later, take out all your position and harvest, you know, 12, 15, 30%, 6% return, like whatever it ends up being. But I don't think that's really the point of why people want to be involved in this. Um, you know, the types of investors we want to attract are those who do understand or want to learn how to understand the broader, longer term nature of what it takes to build companies and to build this type of value and support innovation. Um, and that's where we really want to be is to find those those amazing people that want to be around for the long haul. Great. And how often is that nav price updated in your fund? Is it daily, monthly? How, how does that work if someone logs in and sees the, the nav? Yeah, so it's updated daily. Um, and it's, right. I mean, by daily, it's like business days, right? So sure. anytime that the stock market is, is, uh, you know, shut down for the evening or for the weekend, um, we don't do, we don't touch those days, but any other day we're striking daily, which is what allows us to take, uh, investments on, uh, any day of the week, basically. I, I love that. Even if I'm not changing investments, it's, it's kind of my habit to wake up and just see where I'm at for the day. What's going so, on, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So really quick, before we get out of here. Uh, I was looking through your site and there's something called the Sweater Scout Network. And I was a little bit confused what that is. Can you, can you kind of briefly explain uh, what that's all about? Oh yeah, the Scout Network. Oh my gosh. So the, so the Scout Network is our opportunity for everyday folks to apply to, to work a little more closely with the Sweater uh, Capital Deployment Team to go out and find companies that match our criteria out in the real world. So we started a pilot, um, I guess, probably in late August where we had um, about 50 scouts in it. And we started just organizing ourselves, getting a feel for how we want information to flow, looking at all that kind of stuff. And, you know, trying to determine like, what's the best way to empower everyday folks to be able to go out in the real world and bring back opportunities before anybody else has seen them. We refined all that. And then we put up this, um, this site or this page on the website so that anyone could go in and apply to do it. And it's been up for like, what, maybe 10 days. And we've had over 100 applications. It's insanity. And so we're looking at that saying, okay, well, we want to make sure this is a great experience for everyone. And we want to make sure that everyone has an ample opportunity to bring real, you know, real companies to the table that we can actually invest in. And so we're, we're going through all of our strategy right now saying what's the best way to incorporate that and make the best experience possible for everyone involved. But really, this is like, you know, people talk often, you know, just across the industry of how hard it is to get into venture capital. And being a scout for a fund is probably one of the best ways to get your, your foot in the door, get your feet wet, allow yourself to actually see real deals happening, talk to real founders, start to get a feel for all that stuff so that, um, you know, when you get the opportunity, you know, you might be able to, you know, have more intelligent conversations to, with, with real job opportunities down the road as well. I think that's really cool. And kind of on a related note, what if someone that's listening to the show right now is actually seeking venture funding for their own company? Are they able to reach out to Sweater to possibly pitch their company to you? Yeah, that's always on the table. You know, I think it's pretty easy to find anyone from the Sweater team or, you know, a lot of the scouts are listed on their LinkedIn profiles as well that they're associated with us. And just come find us. Right now, we don't have an official form on the website, um, in part because we are, you know, testing and uh, running through our own processes in the background. And we're, you know, to be very clear, we are not deploying capital until Q1. Um, and so, But we are trying to help founders everywhere that we can. I mean, I, I had a great conversation last week with a founder for about an hour because um, she's raising capital and she's oversubscribed and she was trying to figure out the best way to organize everything. And I was able to, you know, help her think through a lot of the elements that she was facing. And, you know, we hope to do that with the, with the founders that we have found that have high potential so that, you know, we can be friends because, I mean, in the long run, you know, if you're raising a round right now and you're going to close before the end of the year, that doesn't mean we don't want to talk to you. It just means, you know what, we'll be around for your next round. And we're excited about building long-term relationships with founders. So yeah, I mean, if, if someone listening is a founder and they're interested in, in what Sweater's up to, totally reach out. We'd love to talk to you. Awesome. So this is really great information. I love all this. Why don't we just explain before we get out of here, 
what the process is to sign up for people that want to get involved. You go to sweaterventures.com. It's sweaterventures.com. We'll put the link up in our show notes as well. What can potential investors expect uh, when they sign up? Oh yeah, right now it's easy. So go to sweaterventures.com and there's a bunch of prompts for you to join the wait list uh, to learn more information. And that's important, you know, like uh, we jump into that and we've got a lot of emails that we send that orients you on our mission and, and how we're going about actually conducting this process to open up the asset class for everyone. Um, and we have, honestly, we have super high engagement on, on our emails, um, which maybe is a reflection of the quality of our emails, uh, which maybe, or it's just the, you know, the, the nature of what we're doing. It just keeps people very involved. I mean, our, our email open rates are around 40%, which is just fantastic. Nice. And, you know, so we're trying to provide good quality information and insight while you know, also allowing people to continue to hear from us while we wait for the launch to happen in early Q1. So yeah, that's the easiest thing. Just go to the, the website at sweaterventures.com, join the wait list. Uh, you know, if you're super interested in being a scout, you know, go through the process of applying to be a scout and see if that's something that, uh, you know, you feel like you could add some value. And then along the way, you know, there's going to be plenty of other opportunities to get involved um, and to hopefully, you know, maybe even have your face be some of like part of some of our campaigns. You know, there's we nice. definitely want to tap into our audience to help to help tell these stories. And matter of fact, you know, by the time people actually hear this, we will have put out a call for anyone that wants to submit a question about how Sweater works to submit those questions to us. And then we're going to be answering them and turning them into videos and they're going to live in the app. So that's super um, cool. I actually, I actually saw one of your, ad, the reason I found you guys was I saw one of your uh, ad campaigns recently. It was really smart and fun. So um, I, I awesome. should mention too that, if you, if you sign up for the wait list, you don't have to pledge any money right away, but you still get access to all this information in your emails, correct? Yeah, well, that's absolutely right. Yeah. No obligations right now. It's just sign up to learn more, follow along on the story, and then we'll keep you very informed as we approach the market. I think that's really great. So even, even if you don't have money to pledge right now, go to sweaterventures.com, sign up, join the wait list. You'll get access to all this great information. And I think it's going to be a really good learning process for everybody out there because you're one of the, one of the first companies giving access to everybody to this world. And I love it. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. It's been awesome chatting. Thanks for uh, inviting me on and, and just letting me line out how all this stuff's going to work. It's really exciting to be so close to being able to put it in your hands. Yeah. I think everyone's going to be really excited about this. Once again, it's Jesse Randall. He's the CEO of Sweater Ventures. Thank you so much for joining us on Invest Like a Boss. Thanks, man. Derek, phenomenal interview. I really enjoyed that. And boy, I got quite a bit to talk about. So what's your <laughs> takeaway after speaking with Jesse? It, it was pretty much exactly what I thought, honestly. I, I just, I knew that this was going to be a great fit with what we're looking for. And I love these new platforms that are coming out and giving us access to the good old boys club. And uh -huh. the, the good old boys club, it sounds like it's going to be open to everybody very soon. And I think that scares a lot of people too. What do you, what do you think about that? Are all these really ultra high net worth guys and gals, I should put that out there. Are they going to be kind of threatened that, you know, you're kind of on our turf? Yes. And now they need to work a little bit harder to stay competitive with their money. And I think that's exactly what needs to happen in this world. No free give me's. Yeah, you're rich. Yeah, you've made a lot of money. Yeah, you've been successful. You want to grow that money? You're going to have to put in that work. It's no free, no free handouts. All right. You're going to, you want to stay competitive. You're going to have to go out and work a little bit harder to find good deals, good managers, et cetera, because now everybody has access to the same deals that you have. So I think this, this is all good. I also thought it was quite interesting what he said about the SEC where, he's, where SEC was like, risk is important to us, but liquidity is more important. And I was, I was walking down the street today, I was thinking, why is that? Why is liquidity important to the SEC? And I think it has something to do with avoiding massive market cycles and, and depressions because as long as there's liquidity in things, I don't think the markets crash that much. I think it's when things get locked up and people are like, oh shit, I can't get money out of this or that, or I have all these illiquid things. And then they stop spending. And then they, right. they literally go into their house and they're like, buy bread, buy, don't even buy toilet paper, like shut down. Right. And if you, and if there's no liquidity, it's a bad, bad thing. So I think that might actually be why the SEC is most interested in that. That's I agree. not strict, strictly important to to this um, episode, but I, no, I, I mean, I mean, having some, having some liquidity is definitely important, at least for me. And I, it's not the most liquid of assets. You know, you only get two windows a year, but it's still 
mentally in my head, I, you know, if something goes down, I have access to it. I don't have to wait 10 yeah, years dude, for venture and for, for early stage or even private company investing. That's, that's massive liquidity compared to historical right. liquidity. Right. I mean, that's always, that's always a challenge for most people getting into to private investments besides just finding the deals, sourcing the deals, vetting the deals, et cetera. It's just the lockup period. I mean, some of the deals I've been in, I've been in for 10 years. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of good things going for liquidity, like these secondary markets and secondary share sales is awesome. And there's tons of money being made in these things, right? Like people buying secondary shares of companies, like I'm trying to do, um, um, what's the company called? We talk about it all the time, Meta, Metaverse okay. Portfolio. Winner, winner? No, not winner, winner. God damn it. The uh, biggest Explorers? is Explorers? smashing my brain. No, um, <laughs> e, what's it? Metaverse gaming stock. Epic oh. Games. God damn yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Epic Games. Like we're, we're working on a deal right now to get a $50 million allocation with Epic Games through um, somebody we've had on this, this episode before, this podcast before. So <clears throat> that brought up one of my concerns. I thought if you're a brand new fund and no one's in this yet, if, if I start on day one, it's probably going to be years before I see any type of return, but he said, no, they're going to buy it every round. They're going to buy pre-seed, seed A, A and B, yeah. uh, secondary purchases. His example was, you know, if we bought Airbnb in 2009, you would have said, I, I don't know what that is. And that doesn't excite me. Not no, because no one knew what Airbnb was, but if exactly. you, even, even if you bought secondary purchases in 2017 of Airbnb, you'd still crush and you would get those uh, returns a lot sooner. So I don't think you have to worry about waiting years and years and years to see any type of return, even though it's a brand new fund, because they're going to invest at all levels. Well, what's important is the liquidity clause that they're giving you. It's, it's like Fundrise to a lesser example, but you know they, give, they have that liquidity that you can get out every, what is it now? I think it's almost every month, but it used to be every three months or six months. But, but, but still, they're not liquidating assets regularly and they're not winding up the fund for you know, what they've said, five to 10 years, but they still give you that liquidity clause. You know, with, with venture, if, you, if you're in the, the early you are, the longer the whole time typically is. If you're pre-seed or if you're even, you know, if you're, you're investing where it's just basically a, a concept on a, a napkin, you're going to be holding for, on average, you know, five to 10 years at least, right? Unless you're, in, for that company to exit, that's hard mentally to, to put that in your head. Right. But then you have companies like our crowd, they're, they're targeting pre IPO. So they're, they're going and investing uh, in either rounds or via secondary shares of companies before their IPO. So they have, they have a short term time frame of liquidity that they're targeting. And I, actually I've seen, I've seen some of the internal figures from our crowd and they're, they're, they're pretty compelling. Um, the, you know, you always hear this statistic that, Startups, 90% go bust or, or fail to return money, right? And I think that's true. If you, if you think about all the shitty startups that are starting around the <laughs> world that shouldn't be starting. But if you actually use some common sense and, or use like a professional investor to, to vet these deals, I think, you, I think you'll hit more than 50%. I mean, that, that's, I'm, I don't consider myself a professional venture investor, but if you look at my startup portfolio, I'm, I'm well over 50%. If you look at our crowd's portfolio, I, I can't say specific numbers, but they're, they're over 50%. Granted, they're targeting more, you know, more stable businesses that are kind of pre-IPO. But I, I think that, and he, he was talking about in this episode, Anderson Horowitz, that you know, if you had their deal flow, you'd do pretty damn well too. But I think, I think this 90% failure is like when you think of everybody broadly that's starting a startup that has no clue what they're doing. But if you actually have some, some common sense and some deal flow and some patience to pick the right deals, I think you'd do well over 50%. And there's just so many ways that you can collateralize assets and whole thing, you know, invest as debt instead of equity, then you can kind of protect your investment in a lot of ways. So I think I, I think it's never been a better time to be able to get access to venture deals. Uh, and the numbers speak for themselves. Like the, the, the returns in venture funds right now are, are ridiculous. So this is something that I think everyone should be considering having access to and investing in. Yeah. And that brings up the fact that when you're talking there, Sam, if you want to learn more about Sam's philosophy on startups, we actually did a whole episode dedicated to this is episode 179. Sam and I went over uh, the eight things that Sam's learned from startup investing, because Sam, you're right. You've 
you've done way better than the 10% success rate. And, and a lot of it is, is really just been common sense about things to look for. And that was a really good episode. If you want to go back and check it out, it's 179. That was a much more fun episode than the episode you made me record about my top 10 investing <laughs> mistakes. Thanks. That one still stings. <laughs> we, I, won't, I won't plug that one, but I'm sure if you dig a little bit, you can find it. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I thought was really smart about Sweater that I was impressed by too? He, he has zero investors right now. They haven't started yet, but they have 43,000 people on a wait list and they're already surveying these people to ask them uh, relevant questions about any of these businesses that they're looking at jumping in on day one. So they already have a uh, kind of 43,000 uh, people to survey to see the test case for any particular business. If this is something that they would personally yeah. use or anything like that. I thought that was really smart to survey the audience to kind of get a, an idea of how, if this business could work. Testament, testament to the demand there. One other thing I thought it was really interesting when you guys were talking about crowdfunding platforms like Republic. I yep. thought it was a great point. Like the, most of the companies that are on there, it's true. They're not venture quote unquote quality deals. Uh, a lot of them have tried to raise venture capital or, or, or private money and haven't been able to. Uh, but there is another side to that story. Some people are using the crowd to in fact grow a community and get, get kind of a broad set of brand ambassadors. But a lot of companies just aren't set up for, for venture funds, right? And a good example of that is, is the company that I'm invested in in uh, Australia, Black Ops, the brewery. Like breweries aren't going to go out and track venture funds, right? Sure. But it doesn't mean that you can't make 30x on your investment into a startup brewery, right? You invest in a brewery at a million dollar valuation and it grows to four or five locations and it's worth $30 million. So there, there are good quality businesses on those platforms and I think Jesse was, you know, foremost in basically saying that, but it doesn't mean that those, uh, you know, and there's lifestyle businesses that you might want to invest in that aren't going to be your, your 50 X return, but it might be pretty sound businesses, pretty stable, reduce risk. And there might be something really interesting about it. But I think some of these like breweries and distilleries and things like that, they're definitely utilizing crowdfunding and they're interesting businesses to invest in, but they wouldn't necessarily be your, your venture businesses. Yeah. It didn't cross my mind until he brought that up, that that may be the case. And I didn't want to shit on any business, but there's probably a, you know, a good amount in there that did pitch to these big VC funds and they got turned down and their only option was to crowdfund. And that, that could be a red flag, or it just could be a sign that, like you said, it's, it's an industry that, you know, it could grow 30 X, but maybe these VCs are looking for a hundred X and it's just not as compelling to them. So uh, one final thing I want to take away, though, is the fee. Uh, this seems pretty compatible with the other kind of similar uh, funds that we've talked to lately. It's 2% annually. And I, I was surprised that there's no, there's no exit fees on, you know, if a company IPOs or, or anything like that. Is it, did you expect maybe if, let's say, they did invest in Airbnb in 2017 and then the IPO hits and it explodes, I would have thought that they would have been taking some type of fee off of that. Yeah, typical fees for these type of funds are 2% management fee plus 20% 20, carry. Yeah. yeah. So if, if their fees are only 2%, and I, I didn't actually get that out of the episode, I wasn't sure. I meant to actually follow up with you separately. But if they're only 2%, then that's well below what you would expect from a fund like this. If it was two plus 20% carry, I would say that that's on par. Uh, our crowd is a, their fees are pretty expensive, man. It was like, cause I just did a deal through, through our crowd for Remilk and it was 8%, they take 8% upfront Ooh. plus a, tw plus a 20% carry. And the 8% upfront is a 4% kind of administration fee plus a, plus two, four years of 2% upfront. So that's 4%. So 8% upfront right off the top of your investment plus a 20% carry. That is steep. Yeah. They're that paying four steep. years in advance, essentially. Yeah. So basically what they're betting on is just a ton of people that are going to stroke, you know, 20 to $50,000 checks uh, to get access to some of these deals, but it just goes to show you how much demand. I mean, I think in the deal that, that I did with them, they, I, I actually, I don't even know if I'm able to, sp to speak numbers, but let's just say they, they got over 10 million, uh, invested into this deal. 
that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of money from the crowd, right. For one deal at those, at those fees, but it just goes to show how much demand there is to get into these deals. So yeah, I think, I don't know if, if, if it's just 2%, that's, really very small but i think we need to fact check that yeah let me let me circle back with jesse and i'll put any <laughs> notes on the page with that um but uh, you know what I, no one can invest in it right now but i'm gonna join the waiting list actually right after this because i just want those emails with all this information on this stuff even if i don't put any money i love getting emails like like fundrise fundrise sends awesome emails about all these projects they're in, involved in and i am personally invested in fundrise and I, I think if I like what I see in these emails and the info that they're putting out, I'm going to put some money into it. There's one other thing to be said about getting in at, at this level. And that is most people would, would probably listen to this and say, well, I'm not going to be the first money into this fund. You know, they're trying to feel things out and get the gears turning. But from, from my experience, Derek, and probably yours as well, I know for sure, Johnny's, we've looked at these platforms since we started the podcast in 2015, which was early on with, with these these kind of crowd platforms started emerging. And from what I've seen is that the performance on these platforms is much better in the early days. You go back right. to kind of Peer Street, Yield Street, some of these fun, uh, some of these platforms. And our assumption is that this is because early on, they spend a ton of time getting it right. Yep. Because if they get it right, they prove the track record, they can, they can grow both the, the network of investors and, and deals um, at a much larger pace. So like, let's just say for, for sweater, my analysis is, hey, if they, like, if they get the first, if they nail it on the first 100 investments or just say the first 50 investments of the first fund, you know, they're, they're gonna attract deals, they're gonna attract investors like more than they can handle. If they get it wrong, it's sort of, well, <laughs> close up shop, right? Right. Now, when they expand to four funds and all these different deals, once they've got a couple of, of, of good, uh, when they got a good track record under their belt, they can screw up one fund, right? They can, they can yep. afford to, to mess it up. And a lot of times, I think this is what's happening with these, with these platforms is they tend to scale. They get a little bit loose, right? They, they, yep. they need to bring in more deals. They need to accommodate more investors. And they, they you know, they, deal flows, not super easy to, to grow globally in, in a, a completely controlled manner if you want to scale quickly. So I think actually from an investor standpoint, these are the rounds that you want to get in on because you know that they're going to be putting in a lot of time and attention. And is, although they want to get off the ground quickly, they're going to be patient. They're going to pick good deals. They're going to make sure they do their, their, their due diligence. They're going to vet them well. They're going to negotiate to the end of the world for good deal terms. And um, so I, I think from a historical viewpoint, I think these are the, this is when you want to get involved in these companies. I think that's um, a good point too. They've also been sitting on the sideline, just waiting on the SEC. I mean, we've had multiple previous guests where they're just like, the SEC is so backed up. So I got, I got a feel that sweater has some great deals lined up. They're, they're just chomping at the bit to get in on, on right on day one. And they've had the time to negotiate the proper terms and get it right. Because like you said, if it's, Initially, initially, they have to outperform and, and really kill it because that's just going to kill any of their future. It kind of reminds me when I talked to um, Rad Diversified a few episodes back, I said, you know, you're doing 40 percent a year. How are how can you maintain these numbers? And he straight up just said, I, I don't expect to maintain that. That's just <laughs> that's just how it starts when you initially exactly. start these funds. So crush it. Right. All right. So five hundred dollar minimum seems like a, a small chip to bet. Derek, are you in? I think I'm totally in. I'm, I'm for sure joining the wait list. It depends on how long, you know, their SEC stuff is going to take. I, I've heard a lot of these companies say, oh, it's coming next week. It's coming next week. And then three months later, you hear nothing. So I hope that's not the case for them. But I'm going to sign up for the waiting list for sure. I love it. Listeners, I hope this was something that was interesting to you. Venture capital for non-accredited investors. Hopefully they'll get uh, sweater will be opened up uh, globally. They said they're expanding, I think, to, to Hong Kong and Singapore. Obviously, great markets there. And the UK. But and the UK. There you go. This is coming online for everything. 2020s, best 10 years to be an investor, period, across all asset classes. Everything goes up 4x in the 2020s. And then you want to look out because the world's going to get really weird with the metaverse and all this uh, social distancing, I think, is going to become like a common thing. Like even post COVID, everyone's just going to be like, eh, I'm just going to social distance. Like, <laughs> I'm just going to uh, enjoy my devices, do my uh, 16 hours of screen time a day type of thing. Uh, but the 2020s 
is going to is going to absolutely soar. We just got over COVID. All asset classes are at all time highs. It's a scary time to be an investor, but you don't really have a choice because cash is trash. U.S. is probably at ten percent inflation rate. You know your Marcus savings account accounts at negative nine percent on the on the net return. <laughs> I, I got an offer the other day that said high yield savings account. 0.4%. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm looking at my metaverse portfolio. I'm like, damn, I'm up like 30% in eight weeks. And then I'm like, wait a second. That's probably just keeping up with inflation. At this <laughs> Seriously. Point. After I mean, going, my God, everything. After is seeing just the prices soaring. at bars and grocery yeah. stores, I believe. Oh, my it. God. <laughs> I, I just I, I, I just start laughing looking at like the Fed. Oh, inflation's historically 2.3%. And we're projecting <laughs> it's 3.4%. But just no for this way. year, I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck are we taking? advice from the fed anymore and listening to them it's such bullshit man like we've, we've just gone through like 25 percent, 30 percent inflation i'm getting these bills while i'm in barcelona from from like electricity and things in, in the u.s everything is just like skyrocketing so you need to be invested here uh obviously things could explode tomorrow but I don't think they are. I think there's there's enough money in the money supply. You need to get into these companies. People are motivated as hell come out of COVID. And I think the economy is going to just tear upwards as it already has been. Yeah. So, and if you haven't been listening recently, go back and check out our metaverse episodes. Uh, I, I want, I'm kind of laughing because I think Johnny kind of thought this was a little bit of a joke. And I, I've been dipping in a little bit in the same things that you have, Sam, not to the level that you have. But it's been fun sharing some wins lately because uh, things, things are looking good. <laughs> 30% in eight weeks already captured my annual target. And Johnny over there in uh, Ukraine is laughing at our, our three back-to-back metaverse <laughs> episodes. But look what happened, right? It was all about getting in front of the herd. We got in front of the herd. It was only eight weeks in front of the herd, but that was enough because Facebook came out and shook the world. And now every single headline I see is here are my, my eight metaverse uh, <laughs> stock picks. Yep. What are yours? Like, so you got in front of the herd, metaverse portfolio. Uh, what episode was that, Derek? We covered uh, the- Your full portfolio. 30%, did. 30% in eight weeks, including Roblox, which was up 30% yesterday. That's unheard of. A public stock up 30% yesterday. They doubled- their quarterly revenues in three months. And they're already a $60 billion company. So the metaverse is very real. The hype is just starting to build. It's not over yet. And all the metaverse stocks are gonna tear upwards. You have companies like Facebook, they're investing tens of billions of dollars um, and, and everyone's gonna follow suit. So whether the metaverse is what we expect it to be or not, we're betting on the hype and we've won so far. Yeah, and I got to think that any of these deals that Sweater is looking into has got to be really heavy into this metaverse world as well. He said, you know, uh, their big focus is tech, but they're they're going to go across, you know, 40 they, they said 42 out of the 56 categories in pitch book they're interested in, but you wow. know, it's going to be really really tech heavy and the metaverse is just part of that. So, if you're looking to get into some of these companies in early stage, I I mean, check it out. Or at least put your name on the waiting list. It's Sweater Ventures. Dot com. Uh, thanks again to Jesse for coming out. Sam, before we get out of here, I just want to do a really quick thing. We haven't brought it up in so long. It used to be a tradition. Uh, five star reviews because we've had some Let great it ones come in. Yeah, these, these, are, these are super important. We don't thank you guys enough for leaving the reviews, but there's literally no, nothing that helps us to attract better guests quicker than the reviews. It's usually what we use to lead with. We've got these reviews. Check them out. And, uh, and Derek's, Derek's using that as a little bit a bait to come on the show and uh <laughs> it's, it's been fantastic so if if nothing else if you guys haven't had a chance to support the show 30 seconds to leave a review and it helps us out tremendously derek let's hear some of the new five-star reviews all right shout out ked run who says they're a property manager and says the podcast is really available content help me to understand how to make side income while doing a full-time job love the side hustle uh, sounds B 1989, super easy. If you just want to leave a review like this, we love it too. Simply great podcast, five stars. Uh, Maddie says, so informative, really love the way this podcast dives into new and interesting topics in the world of investing. Sam and Johnny are hyper tuned to the pulse of investing today. And this podcast is super helpful when navigating strategies, new platforms, and more. Sam, you're hyper tuned. <laughs> I think I know a Maddie. Do I know Maddie? I hope I don't. Are you paying for reviews here, Sam? I, oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
It would be an unbiased <laughs> review if it's not, but I do, I do know a Maddie that sounds kind of like the tone, but uh, anyways, <laughs> thanks for the reviews. Honestly, they, they, you'll probably hear this in the outro, but they help more than, you know, uh, <laughs> Patreon's massive support. If you guys are able to, to contribute just $5 a month uh, to the Patreon group, that goes directly to paying for our production costs. It's the reason that we've been able to, to scale our, our output of episodes uh, to every single week. In fact, right now, as I'm finishing this glass of wine, I have two more recordings tonight. So if you think you, we're sleeping on the job, guys, we're, uh, we're, we're very busy over here trying to crank out good content for you all. No, nah, we're busier than ever. And I, I, I don't know. I'm loving it. Um, and coming up too in Patreon, if you are a Patreon member, Mastermind. We haven't done one in like three, four months. So really excited for that. Sunday, November 21st, it'll be uh, Sam, Johnny, and myself. And we're just talking to you guys. It's a large Zoom call. We're sharing ideas, what we're invested in, what we're seeing in the market. Uh, and it's really just a good opportunity to network with other bosses. And there's people from all over the world. I, I'd say on average, we have 10 plus countries represented on a mastermind. So it's really cool to meet everybody, find out how you learned about the show and what you're invested in. Um, I've actually pulled some ideas out of mastermind that have made money. So, I mean, for as little as, you know, five, $10 a month in Patreon, just even these calls are really valuable. So excited to see everybody on November 21st for our mastermind. But you know, you know what the best one-two punch is? It's doing the masterminds and then doing a meetup because everyone from the mastermind that gets familiar with people from the mastermind and collaborates. Then we do the meetup and we go somewhere really cool, look at an investing idea, have some beers, do a little bit of venture and travel and something good always happens out of these, these events and that kind of one-two punch. So Head on over to Patreon, throw them for just $5 a week. But other than that, listeners, we appreciate you. Jesse, thanks for coming on the show. Derek, I got to bounce because you lined me up with two hours more <laughs> on my Tuesday night, and I'm, I need some energy for that. <laughs> All right, get to work, Sam. Crack a second bottle. See you guys later. All right, see ya. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.